And uh, also, I would say that probably is the scientist giving the most relevant contribution in the last, uh, say, 10 years in the development on the studies on the formation of multiple populations in global clusters. I have no time, actually, of going through all the uh, methodology that he set up uh, during this year to recognize and identify the multiple population in, uh, in all, actually, the galactic global clusters investigated, um, setting up a method based, for example, on the combination of HEC filters that allow the best identification of the different populations. He's also the leader of this uh, uh, HST ultraviolet uh, violet legacy survey, uh, which is really important because it allowed the identification uh, of the helium spread, for example, and of uh, other things which were of paramount importance for the development of this field. So I'm not going uh, past this because I think uh, <laughs> it would take a long time. Uh, today he's talking about the recent uh, investigations which uh, uh, are based on the uh, James uh, Webb Space Telescope data in the context of the multiple Thank you very much, Antonio. Thank you, Paolo. And uh, yeah, it's a really a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for uh, this uh, time together. And uh, yeah, it's uh, really an honor to be here. Here is a place uh, where uh, many of uh, the old ideas and the recent ideas of multiple population started. Uh, the group in Rome is uh, famous because of uh, many of you. And in particular, uh, of course, uh, I, we, we have to, uh, I mean, the work by Franca. Franca started this kind of uh, analysis and uh, she's kind of responsible uh, for maybe the most important uh, discoveries of the last 40 years, I would say, including some new recent uh, results. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to see Vittoria, Marcella, Roberta, Flavia, and uh, Paolo, of course, and all the friends and the collaborators here in, uh, in Rome. And uh, okay, of course, I will present results from um, from many people and the, in, in, in these papers that the, 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 the collaborators I mentioned are, are all involved. And uh, okay, just to introduce myself to people who do not know me, I'm uh, in, uh, in Padova and here in this slide there is my information. So please do not hesitate to contact me for, uh, for, for just for chatting or multiple populations or uh, for discussion or for, uh, for everything. And uh, okay, a little bit of my personal history. I'm from Sicily. I come from Barcelona, which is a small town here in Sicily. And um, these are places where I grew up. We also have snow in Sicily. And these, um, and then okay, then I moved to Padova to do my master, uh, my master thesis. This the master thesis with uh, Gianpaolo Piotto and uh, his uh, group, uh, Luigi Bedin and uh, the other people in Padova, who also provided the uh, fundamental contribution to the field of multiple populations. I moved to Tenerife, to Canary Island. And um, yeah, it was a beautiful experience uh, being there for a couple of years. And um, that was my institute, the Institute of Astrophysics in Canary Islands. And then I moved to Australia. That was the Mount Stromlo Observatory where I worked for five years. And uh, this was typical pictures from uh, my window. And this was a uh, typical outcome of uh, observing from Australia. And uh, it was my life in Australia. These are real money. And uh, okay, my life changed in 2018 when I came back to Italy, changed from this to this. And this is uh, when I'm back to Padova. Of course, I, I love Padova, I'm just kidding. And um, yeah, and um, now I'm doing uh, research, but I'm also doing uh, several other activities, like uh, classes, uh, lectures, uh, and uh, 
yeah, this was typical, uh, this was during my lecture. This was one of the most brilliant students I had, and, and then I'm serious. And okay, so after my professional life, let's talk about my private life. Because okay, I told you are my best friend. And uh, okay, this is my, okay, let's talk about love. Of course, not this, but this. And uh, yeah, I fall in love with the globular clusters, <laughs> which is kind of sad thing. And um, yeah, I, okay, you know what uh, what uh, globular clusters are, and um, you know why they are important. And I like globular cluster for uh, for 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 uh, for this. This is uh, one of the deepest images of uh, the universe taken by human beings. So this is uh, the Hubble ultra deep field. And uh, actually, yeah, from my point of view, this is um, if if I ask, what do you say here? Maybe you will say galaxies, distant galaxies. But uh, actually, this is an image of stars because all the light, all the information from this picture come from stars. So, um, yeah, what uh, we know is that the stars are the fundamental units of uh, the universe and most of the stars born in, star born in clusters. And in particular, I'm interested in uh, these uh, globular clusters because uh, many of them formed uh, in this uh, in this period you see this is the uh, picture of the history of uh, the universe from the big bang we have the inflation we have the dark ages the development of galaxies planets and other structures and okay globular clusters formed around this uh, period so what uh, we try to do is kind of uh, galactic uh, archaeology we study the globular clusters that we observe today to shed information on the first phases of the globular cluster history. And um, okay, I show you how the situation has changed in the past uh, few years, at least from the photometric point of view, because from the photometric point of view, this was the state of the art uh, in um, yeah in 2008 15 years ago and okay this is a column to diagram of uh, ngc 6397 which is uh, the globular cluster with the, the closest distant models from us and this is beautiful data set this is more than 100 orbits with the hubble space telescope the data reduction is the state of the art it was performed by jay anderson who is kind of guru of uh, photometry with the hubble and you see the sequences in this diagram are very narrow and very well defined and uh, looks very similar as the red line which is the model of a simple stellar population so because of this kind of uh, plots we consider globular clusters as prototype of simple stellar population i would say that when i started the global cluster with Consider it as boring uh, objects. And I will show now how the situation has changed from the photometric point of view in the past uh, few years. And uh, okay, this is because of mm, several kinds of contribution. First of all, the contribution of uh, last generation uh, telescopes, like uh, the Hubble Space uh, uh, Telescope, but also thanks to the development of a uh, new uh, method for data reduction and uh, he is uh, jay anderson who is uh, the main responsible together with other people like andrea bellini uh, mattia liberato and other people who are responsible for the development of uh, the new method uh, of uh, data reduction and uh, also this is because uh, of uh, the um, uh, introduction of uh, new method of data analysis that i will introduce and i will discuss in the next slides Okay, the work on multiple population is kind of huge work. There are thousands of papers published in the past few years. So it's impossible for me to review everything. So today I will just summarize the contribution of uh, these young people. And okay, here there is somebody who you may know because uh, some of them have been in Rome, Marco, Tylo. He provided a huge contribution to the results that I'm going to discuss. And also Eduardo, who was a uh, 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 another person who provide uh, um, important uh, ideas and contribution to the field and he also come from uh, from uh, from uh, rome and um okay let's just briefly um summarize the new method okay from the new, new methods we have uh, very accurate analysis of uh, the data we derive a very 
high resolution uh, uh, maps of uh, differential reddening as the, the map that uh, I show here. This is part of a survey of globular cluster with the Hubble Space Telescope and with the ground-based wide field facilities. So now these maps are publicly available to all of us and are mostly come from the contribution from Young and uh, Leniardi and uh, other people, of course. And uh, okay, with this kind of analysis, you can remove from photometry the contribution of differential reddening. Differential reddening is responsible for uh, uh, some kind of uh, artifacts, fake uh, sequences. And okay, this is the original diagram. This is the correct one after uh, accounting for our reddening maps. And uh, okay, this is the situation. This is what we get after applying the best possible uh, data reduction and the correction of for all the spurious effects. This is 47 TAC. Of course, in this case, there is no reddening. And uh, what you see is something that is very different from the picture of the simple stellar populations that you have seen before. Because what you see and that the cluster is characterized by distinct sequences in the color mantle diagram. And these distinct sequences can be followed everywhere, from the tip of the region branch down to the turn off the Sajan branch and to the bottom of the main sequence. So globular clusters are not boring. They are very complex stellar system, as I will show in the next slides. Of course, uh, we can um, make uh, some kind of strange color magnitude diagram. I call them super color magnitude diagrams. And uh, to do this, we use uh, appropriate combinations of uh, colors and uh, magnitudes in the ultraviolet uh, in the far ultraviolet, in the blue region of the spectrum, we got a, approved a, a large program with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, the leader of the project, uh, the PI, is Giampaolo Piotto, and we got uh, a huge amount of data in the, these uh, beautiful photometric bands for uh, almost all nearby globular clusters, more than 55 globular clusters. And okay, with this beautiful data set and with the archive data, we can now build appropriate diagrams. And okay, let's start with the 2808. And uh, let's make this diagram. This is sensitive to nitrogen. You see it's very complex object. But uh, if you, we move to this other uh, diagram, well, the situation looks very different. This is a diagram which is sensitive to helium. In this case, we have uh, three maybe four, maybe more than four sequences. So the situation look very different from the previous plot. It's like we are observing different objects. So we have different combination of filters and we have uh, uh, apparently different pictures of uh, the globular clusters. So what uh, we try to do is to combine these uh, super color magnitude diagram to maximize the information on multiple populations. We derive the so-called chromosome map of globular clusters. This nickname is because this diagram pretends to get information, all information about multiple populations in globular cluster. And I'll show you now how to get the chromosome map starting from the super color magnitude diagram. So this is a, a color magnitude diagram sensitive to helium. This is sensitive to nitrogen. I'll show you how to make the chromosome map for the Regian branch, but of course you can do the same for the other evolutionary sequences or for some evolutionary sequences. So let's first um, uh, zoom in, select the Regian branch stars in the in these uh, in these uh, column two diagrams. So after we select the stars, we derive the red and the blue boundaries, and we start to verticalize the diagrams like this, so that. Um, after the verticalization, we have uh, these uh, delta quantities and uh, we can plot uh, one delta quantity against uh, the other. And uh, well, what we see is that uh, the globular cluster is not something single, simple, but we observe these multiple blobs and each of these blobs corresponds to different stellar populations. You see, in this uh, slide is what we expect from the simple stellar population hypothesis. And this is what we observe in the real globular cluster. Well, the situation is very complex in terms of multiple populations, but in all clusters, we can recognize two main groups of first 
and second population stars. I like to call it the first and second generation stars for reasons that you will maybe better understand later. So the idea is that, okay, these stars formed uh, in the early universe. These globular clusters are objects that are kind of 13 giga years old. So uh, we want to understand how did they form at a high redshift. And uh, of course, there are uh, uh, several scenarios. The most popular one is that uh, we have uh, two main generation of stars. A first generation of stars, which are uh, the stars around the origin of the chromosome map. And then we have a second generation or more than one second generation that formed uh, later and they've been polluted by material ejected by more massive first generation stars. The problem uh, in, in, this, in, this, in this slide, you already see some, uh, some, some problem with this, uh, this picture, with this hypothesis. And in the, if you have a look at the chromosome map, you see that the majority of stars belong to the second generation, while only 20 or 30% of stars, at least in this cluster, belong to the first generation. It's like uh, having uh, something like, uh, like this uh, is something like uh, we have um, uh, a first generation of people and uh, a huge second generation. How can you generate this? So this is the challenge. And um, okay, the um, best way to fix the problem is to assume that the first generation its formation was uh, much more massive, was something like this. And the globular clusters, the protoglobular clusters, lost most of their first generation stars into the galactic halo. So the first generation stars are responsible for uh, the assembly of the galactic halo. You can make some calculations. These are uh, from the paper by Alvio Renzini. And you can find that uh, um, depending on the initial condition, it is possible that a significant fraction of the galactic halo is being generated by second generation stars in globular clusters. And of course, again, coming back to the conclusion by Renzini and the collaborators, these massive protostar clusters that were maybe 10 times more massive at formation, well, they formed stars at high redshift. So maybe they provide significant contribution to the rayonization of the universe as well. So if this scenario is correct, if the multi-generation scenario is correct, we have uh, seen important consequences in terms of uh, assembly of the Milky Way and in terms uh, of uh, uh, our understanding of, uh, the, um, of the, 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 the main problems, uh, the, 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 the realization of the universe and the cosmology. But uh, we have uh, alternative scenarios, like the one proposed by Gilles and collaborators. In these uh, uh, alternative scenarios, the globular clusters uh, well, of course, they host multiple populations because we see the multiple populations. But all stars formed at the same time. In this case, the second generation stars, which are the stars with this crazy chemical composition, well, they do not correspond to a second burst of star formation, but they just, uh, the, the crazy chemical composition come from uh, the accretion of polluted material uh, from stars of the same generation. Well, in this case, of course, uh, the contribution to the assembly of the galaxy and the reionization of the universe is different. So uh, to try to address uh, this problem, come back uh, to the analysis of the chromosome map. Of course, there are several approaches. There is the spectroscopic one, there is the photometric one, there is mixed photometric and spectroscopic approach. I will describe today these uh, spectrophotometric uh, technique, uh, this spectrophotometric approach. So first of all, uh, okay, this is the plot of a simple stellar population, and uh, this is the chromosome map of 47 TAC. And we identify one, two, three, four, five stellar populations. Even uh, the stars in the first uh, generation, as you see, are not chemically homogeneous. We have at least two groups of stars, A and B. And actually these stars are telling us uh, a lot about the chemical composition of the primordial clouds where globular clusters formed. And I will show later the results by uh, Fabio Lamarino and by uh, Maria Vittoria Legnardi about this new phenomenon that has been discovered only recently. Well, uh, the reason why the chromosome map is a powerful tool to investigate multiple populations is that the, the position of each star in the map 
is uh, a, a proxy of uh, its stellar composition. In this specific chromosome map, the one uh, built with these filters, uh, we have a sensitivity to helium and nitrogen. So the position of each star in this diagram provides information about nitrogen and about helium in a monometallic stellar population. And it is important the fact that we have this dependence from helium because it is very challenging to measure helium in stars from spectroscopy. This is possible only in a tiny amount of stars in a tiny uh, interval of temperature and luminosity. And it's been done only for a few stars uh, in a few globular clusters. Again, uh, have a look at the papers by Marino and collaborators 2014 and, uh, other and other papers on a few stars. But with photometry, we are able to do this uh, for uh, thousands, under thousands or maybe million stars in uh, virtually all uh, globular clusters. And OK. Now that we have learned how to build the map and how to read the chromosome map of a globular cluster, we can make an atlas of uh, uh, chromosome maps uh, in uh, globular clusters. We can make an atlas of multiple populations. And OK, this is just uh, a small uh, uh, subsample from uh, the entire sample of clusters that we have analyzed. And OK, from a visual inspection of these chromosome maps, we immediately uh, find some uh, interesting uh, results. First of all, the point is that the, the, the first uh, the first point is that uh, uh, the behavior of multiple populations significantly changes from one cluster to another. In some clusters like 2808, we have a very extended chromosome maps, while in other clusters like M4, the chromosome map is uh, less extended. Also, the numbers of blobs in the chromosome maps changes from one cluster to another. And uh, we also see that in some clusters, we have a single sequence of black stars, while in other cluster, we have this additional sequence of uh, red stars on the red side of the chromosome map. So we have a huge variety. What we observe, regardless of the variety, is that the, the first and second population stars are kind of discrete. We have a blob of first generation stars, and then we have some empty space in the chromosome map, and then we have a second generation stars. And uh, so we have variety, we have discreteness, and then the, the number of blobs uh, changing from one cluster to another, and the extension of the chromosome map changing from one cluster to another. This is from uh, the HST survey in our 2017 paper. And uh, okay, these are beautiful chromosome maps, but HST is limited to a small, uh, um, uh, field of view in the center of the clusters. We can build uh, uh, chromosome maps uh, also by using ground-based uh, photometry, and this is the results of a recent paper published a few days uh, ago. So in this case, uh, there is the advantage of having a big field of view because we can investigate multiple population from the center of the cluster out to the tidal um, uh, radius, I would say. And uh, of course, the chromosome maps and the multi-population survey I show were those uh, related to the um, regional branch uh, for simplicity, but we can do the same for the other evolutionary sequences. And uh, there are works, uh, for example, by Emanuele Vedandoglio and uh, by Eduardo Lajoy about the surveys of multiple populations with the similar techniques, but uh, on the red horizontal branch uh, or on the um, asymptotic giant branch. Anyway, from all these studies on multiple populations, it results that we have, uh, okay, that globular clusters are very different from each other, but that they have, they share some uh, common properties. And uh, one of the common properties is that we can distinguish two main classes of globular clusters. A class of globular cluster with a single sequence in the, in the chromosome map, these are type, type one or normal globular cluster. It's about 82% or something like that uh, of the, total amount of clusters. And then we have type two globular cluster, the anomalous globular cluster, which comprise about 18% of the total sample of studied clusters. It, when uh, people started investigating these type two globular clusters, uh, I just to mention a few words on uh, um, 1851 by David Young, uh, M22 by Fabiola Marino, and again, same authors for uh, 5286 and other clusters. Well, they found that these clusters were very similar to Omega Centauri, and they were very similar to M54. Omega Centauri and M54 are historically considered 
as the remnants of dwarf galaxies. N54, because it's located in the nucleus of the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy, and the Omega Centauri for the complexity of uh, iron variation in its stellar populations. So, uh, N54 looks like the other globular, anomalous globular clusters. And the same for Omega Centauri. So, this is, for example, M2, very similar as uh, M54 in terms of uh, chromosome maps. And, uh, okay, so there is this uh, suggestion that uh, if M54 and Omega Centauri are remnants of dwarf galaxies, maybe why not all the other anomalous globular clusters can be uh, remnants of uh, uh, dwarf uh, galaxies. Uh, so, okay, just to, summarize, just to summarize the properties that we have uh, detected on, in terms of um, multiple stellar populations. I discussed about uh, the discreteness of first and second generation. I described, I discussed about ubiquity because as if you've seen the globe, the multiple populations are present in almost all globular clusters. I talk about variety and I talk about these two type of uh, one and type two globular clusters. Let's now searching for um, properties of the distinct stellar populations. And for doing this, we start to compare the extreme cases. Let's start to compare the smallest, the, the, class, the globular cluster with the smallest mass and Omega Centauri, which is the most massive globular cluster in the Milky Way. Okay, this is the small one. Well, the multiple population pattern is uh, simple, but still we have uh, two stellar populations. And this is the, what we expect from errors and this is uh, the multiple populations of these clusters. And uh, this is uh, Omega Centauri. Well, in this case, uh, the pattern of multiple populations, it's very, it's very complex. We have more than 16 stellar populations. And um, okay, so we have, uh, these are, this is about the extreme, but what about the, uh, the analysis of all the clusters? Well, it's very difficult to, to now to, have a look at each chromosome map and uh, discuss about details uh, of uh, each mass. We can use some parameters that quantify the complexity of the mass. The first one is the width of the chromosome map, which is uh, a proxy of uh, nitrogen. And uh, okay, if we plot the uh, nitrogen variation after removing the dependence of metallicity and after complex analysis, this has been done by Eduardo, for example, in this paper. Well, what we observe is that um, the Nitrogen variation, the maximum nitrogen variation correlates with the cluster mass. Small mass clusters uh, have a small uh, uh, nitrogen variation, but the massive ones uh, have a big, huge nitrogen variation. And the same is uh, for, uh, for helium. We have developed some sophisticated methods to infer the helium abundance for uh, the color monograms. And again, we have this uh, beautiful correlation with the cluster mass. And uh, Another important information is uh, about uh, the maximum helium abundance. Uh, we see that the, uh, the, um, the helium range in terms of mass fraction ranges from less than 0 0.01 in terms of solar masses to more than 0 0.1. This is the, uh, the cluster with the highest value. And this is from the, the paper by Marco Zennar, also Marcella Di Crescenzo uh, published similar results uh, years ago. So another property, another thing that we can do is to count the, num the fraction of stars in the first and in the second generation. And we see again that the fraction of first generation stars, the, star, the fraction of stars that looks like uh, normal, that looks like halo stars, uh, well, changes again from cluster to cluster and ranges from less than 10% in Omega Centauri to more than 60% in low mass clusters. And again, we have a correlation, anti-correlation with the cluster mass. So we are collecting this information about uh, galactic globular clusters. Actually, we have developed, this is again another work from uh, Soi Young and collaborators. We have developed another method for uh, uh, detecting and exploring the multiple population phenomenon by using the integrated light. So we plan to extend the analysis to the globular clusters outside the local field. But okay, this is uh, uh, another, another, another story. So, okay, let's uh, summarize the 
new properties. We have a dependence on cluster mass, the complexity of the cluster depends and increases with cluster mass, and uh, we can also detect the maximum human answered, which is, uh, I would say, is uh, typically below 0 0.36, but maybe we have uh, some case where the value can be a bit uh, higher. Um, we also can uh, investigate the dependence from uh, the galactic environment. And uh, when we investigated the dependence on the galactic environment, what we see is that, uh, yeah, okay, as I said, we have this dependence on the fraction of first generation stars from uh, the mass of the host globular cluster. But if we select uh, clusters with the large galactic, um, perigalactic radius, so the clusters that are far away from the center of the Milky Way, and the clusters that has, have uh, probably less uh, interaction with the, the Milky Way. Well, these clusters uh, for a fixed value of the mass or a fixed value of the absolute luminosity have a higher fraction of first generation stars. And um, if we extend our analysis to the Magellan clouds, well, uh, we see that uh, the fraction of first generation stars is even higher. And uh, what happens is that uh, this is if we use present day mass, but if we use the initial mass of the clusters from Baumgart and Dilker, then the difference disappears. So we have collected a number of observational evidence. Uh, now we will use these observational evidences to understand the formation history of the, of the globular clusters. So we have correlation with the initial mass. The correlation improves if we use the initial mass, uh, then we can uh, investigate the relation between the fraction of first generation stars and the present day mass of uh, the first generation. In this case, the correlation is poor. While uh, if we do the same, but for the second generation, then the correlation is a, a very strong one. So we combine these uh, four uh, information and uh, we run uh, simple simulations. In these simple simulations, uh, we assume that the fraction of the first generation stars follow this trend. And then we make these clusters uh, losing first generation stars. And if we do this, and uh, uh, we make the cluster preferentially losing the first generation stars, well, what we found is uh, the red points. And the red points match the four conditions that we observed from uh, the galactic and the extragalactic globular clusters. So in the initial condition of the simulations, we assumed that the globular clusters were significantly more massive at formation, but we also assumed that they preferentially lost, they preferentially lose first generation stars. So this is a condition that is mandatory to reproduce the observations. So I will conclude that from this analysis, um, the observed fraction of first and second generation stars in galactic and extragalactic clusters are consistent with the scenario where the clusters were significantly more massive at formation. And uh, most importantly, they lost preferentially their first generation. So now let's move to uh, a different topic. The, all the plots that I showed you before, they have all a common feature. All of them are based on ultraviolet uh, photometry. Maybe so, some of them, those of by Young and collaborators who were based from ground-based photometry, others who were based from HST photometry, but all of them are based on uh, ultraviolet photometry. And the problem is that uh, when we use the ultraviolet, the present day facilities that are sensitive to ultraviolet photometry do not allow us to get uh, precise photometry for very faint stars. So all information on multiple population come from radio M branch stars, or maybe in some cases, uh, upper main sequence stars. But all the stars uh, that we have explored are stars more massive than something like uh, 0.6 solar masses. So this is the Coleman 2 diagram. Uh, this is uh, the region we know, but the, most of the diagram, most of the stars in the diagram are unexplored. And um, this is a the understanding the behavior of multiple populations in low mass stars is crucial to address our question. Because, um, okay, in the first case, if we have multiple generation scenarios, 
then okay, all second generation stars formed out of the same material. So they have all the same chemical composition. But if we assume accretion scenario, if we assume the scenario where we don't, we do not have multiple generation of stars, then in this case, uh, we have accretion. If, and uh, for example, in the case of bond accretion, the amount of polluted material depends on the stellar mass. So we expect that in the low mass stars, we have smaller variations of um, uh, chemical uh, uh, abundances of globular clusters. We cannot do this kind of investigation with the ultraviolet. We cannot do it with the, the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. So let's see what happens with the James Webb Space Telescope. And uh, these are uh, results uh, from uh, a paper and uh, an approved uh, Hubble Space Telescope uh, JWST proposal by Fabiola Marino and the collaborators. Before showing the, some preliminary results, uh, let me start uh, investigating the properties that we expect from multiple populations uh, with the JWST. So here we simulated uh, the spectra of first generation and second generation stars and calculated the, the flux ratio. And the, this is for the region branch. And the, for the region branch, the difference is uh, negligible. So with the JWST, we are not able to detect, uh, almost not able to detect multiple population along the region branch, which is very disappointing. We can do the same for the main sequence, for the bright part of the main sequence. So the, the part of the main sequence, let's say, that we used to investigate with the, the Hubble Space Telescope. And again, also in this case, you see the difference is very tiny. Also in case of huge human variation, we have a, very, a difference of a few hundreds of magnitude. So again, it's not uh, an efficient instrument to investigate multiple populations in the region branch and in the main sequence, in the upper main, in the upper main sequence. But uh, if we go at the bottom of the main sequence, if we go below the main sequence knee in the regime of M dwarfs, where it is not possible to investigate multiple populations in the ultraviolet, then you see that the, the difference between the spectra of the first and the second generation, it's a huge, we have a huge variation that approaches 0 0.2 magnitudes for the level of this star, which is uh, around uh, 4,000 Kelvin. So this is the wavelength range of the JWST. Of course, we can compare the, we can integrate these spectra for the JWST filters. We can choose the combination of filters that is convenient to investigate this phenomenon. Actually, just, 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 to, just, just to summarize, the, the reason why we have these features is because of the molecules. So these stars are very cold, so we have a lot of molecules in the atmospheres. Most of these molecules are characterized by the presence of the oxygen, and they are molecules such as the, the titanium oxygen molecule, vanadium oxygen molecule, or water molecule. The water molecule is uh, the main responsible for the feature absorption. So basically, we are able to observe multiple populations with the JWST at the bottom of the main sequence. We are able to observe the faintest stars, the multiple populations among the faintest stars in the universe with the JWST, thanks to water. And of course, from the amount of water, we are able to estimate the amount of oxygen in the stellar population. So I come back to this slide. If the accretion scenario is correct, we expect that the variation in light element is small for low mass stars and is large for massive stars. Otherwise, if the other scenario is correct, then we have the same uh, variation. So basically, this is a simulation by Giacomo. And um, this is what we expect in the case of multiple generation scenario. So this is the range of HST but these are filters, JWST filters. So in the case of multiple generation, we, have, we expect a given variation, a large variation, a large separation between the multiple populations, so the multiple sequences among the M dwarfs. And uh, this is uh, what we expect instead in case of a single generation and the bondy accretion of stars. So uh, Fabiola and other people got time to use the JWST to make this kind of investigation. 
Their proposal uh, is mostly focused on the spectroscopy, but I will talk about some preliminary results based on uh, photometry. And um, this is a work uh, led by Fabiola, but we have, of course, the contribution of all the many other people. In particular, we have the contribution by Tulila Ziotto, who just started the PhD in Padova with us. And okay, this is uh, the beautiful column and two diagram that we get from the JWST. The cluster is a 47 tuck, and uh, all the bright stars are saturated. This is the main sequence knee for 47 tuck. I guess that this is the deepest diagram for now. I expect even deeper color among two diagrams of globular clusters in the next uh, uh, few months or few weeks, uh, thanks to the observation of JWST. But this is really, really impressive. And we get something like two magnitudes below this, uh, this limit. Okay. This is the main sequence, the upper main sequence. This is the main sequence knee. Most of the data from the ground just stop here, and the data from the HST maybe stop at this level. We observe the entire sequence of star or the entire main sequence of stars uh, down to somewhere we are going towards the hydrogen burning limit. This is the Magellanic Cloud. This is the small Magellanic cloud, which is in the ground 47 tuck. Observational errors uh, are uh, are small. So this broadening is, of course, not due to observational errors, but it's intrinsic. We observe that below the main sequence, as expected from multiple populations, we have a broadening, an intrinsic broadening. And uh, OK, we have uh, some overlap with the HST data. And by using this uh, overlap, we can calculate proper motions. By matching the JWST images and the HST images, we can get proper motion. By using the proper motions, we can separate the stars in the Magellanic cloud from the stars of 47 TAC. Unfortunately, we are limited by the Hubble Space Telescope images. So for uh, all these stars, we do not have uh, proper motion information for now. But uh, okay, these stars. Uh, are a tiny fraction of the entire stars analyzed by JWST because the overlap is partially alone. But uh, we observe, we confirm the spread. And uh, so now we are in a position that we can finally test uh, the two scenarios for the formation of multiple populations. And uh, this is 47 TAC from Hubble. This is the upper part of the sequence. And of course, in this case, we are able to characterize very well the multiple populations. And um, we are able to do spectroscopy. For example, the spectroscopy of region branch stars has been done by several authors, including the Dobrovolskas and collaborators in 2014. This is a, a very accurate spectroscopic analysis of sodium, and most importantly for us, of oxygen. So based on spectroscopy, we know very well the range of um, oxygen among region branch stars. I will call region branch stars as massive stars. They have masses of uh, about uh, 0.8 solar masses. So what we can do now is uh, uh, looking at isochrons with different uh, oxygen abundance at the bottom of the main sequence. Fabiola will do this with the spectroscopy for some stars. But for now, let's just focus on, on photometry. So these are two isochrons with different chemical composition as the first and second population stars, but without accounting for oxygen variation. These two isochrons have the same oxygen variations. So this is to say that the other elements have a small impact on the chemical composition of multiple populations among very low mass stars. These are isochrons calculated by Aaron Dotter, who is our collaborator in this project. And then this is what happens if we use exactly the same oxygen abundance variation as observed for uh, red giant branch stars. And uh, what we see from this plot is that the width of uh, the main sequence, even if the match, of course, is not uh, perfect at the very bottom of the main sequence, but the width, we are interested in the, in the width of the main sequence, is uh, the same as the one that uh, we observe. So this is a demonstration that uh, we have. Um, we need uh, that in low, very low mass stars and uh, 
massive stars share the same oxygen abundance. And these are the nice, the, 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 the beautiful results from the GWST. We can do something with the, also with the, the Hubble Space Telescope. We did the survey with the Hubble Space Telescope based on a proposal where we had the PI. And this is the paper by Emanuele Dondoglio. He has a, a lot of clusters in his paper. There is an important contribution also from um, Emanuele Bortolan and from Fabrizio Muratore, who are working on the same data set. And uh, okay, from HSD, they confirm the results from Hubble Space Telescope. So uh, when we compare the oxygen abundances inferred from the massive stars and the low mass stars, we have the same result. And uh, they have been also able to derive the mass functions of the two stellar populations in a couple of clusters. And these mass functions are uh, uh, the same, have the same slope, the same parameters along the entire mass range from massive stars towards the hydrogen burning limit. So these results conclude our uh, talk of uh, today and uh, based uh, on the new results of uh, the Hubble Space Telescope of the Hubble Space Telescope and the JWST telescope, we are now able to know better the uh, formation and the evolution of multiple populations in globular clusters. And uh, okay, I think that uh, the time is gone. I just uh, take a few moments. The, of course, I'm sorry uh, to have a look uh, at these. Uh, this uh, recent paper by Maria Vittoria Legnardi and the, by the investigation done from spectroscopy by Fabiola about uh, the chemical composition of first generation stars. Because uh, from these first generation stars that from the chromosome map looks, they do not look chemically homogeneous. Well, from these, uh, um, from, uh, these first generation stars, we are now able to conclude that all globular clusters uh, have iron variation in their first uh, stellar populations. This iron variation changes from cluster to clusters and uh, are telling us a story where uh, the um, are telling us a story where the first stellar population was uh, very extended at uh, its formation and um, uh, while the second generation stars formed it in the very center of the globular clusters. And I'm sorry because I have not time to discuss these interesting results in details, but uh, please have a look at these uh, papers. And uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention.